from the 2022 Food Justice Summit, Feedback, Meeting in the Middle is the title of this year's summit. Uh, this is a collaborative effort between the Adirondack Health Institute and the Adirondack Food System Network. My name is Dylan Klepitar. I'm the farm advocate at the Essex Farm Institute, um, a, a project of the Adirondack Council. Um, the session we have today um, will be led by our two presenters, John and Katie Culpepper, um, talking about Compost for Good, their project, and helping sow the, the next generation of composting and waste diversion pro uh, projects in the North Country. Uh, before we kick off this session, we want to give a, sh a, a huge shout out to our sponsors. They've been instrumental. They've helped make this whole year possible, this event possible, and we truly appreciate appreciate their effort and support. Um, and thank you also to our keynote and premier sponsors, the New York State Health Foundation and the Glens Falls National Bank and Trust Company. Now, before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. Um, during the session, all of our uh, viewers will be muted with the video off for the entirety of the presentation. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't ask questions. I'll be monitoring the chat. So we welcome uh, questions of our presenters and uh, I'll probably reserve those questions uh, for the end and I'll relay them to our presenters so that they can respond to you. Uh, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the, at the end of the presentation. Um, just for your information, all these presentations for this year's summit are being recorded. Uh, they'll be archived on the website and available at ahihealth.org slash 2022FJS. Um, and I will probably drop that in the chat so you have a link to that. Lastly, we'll be sending out a survey on February 25th, and we would love to hear your feedback um, not just about this presentation, but uh, the summit in general. And without further ado, I'm very excited to, to introduce John and Katie Culpepper from Compost for Good. Um, like I said, they've been blazing trail with uh, exciting and inspiring uh, compost projects. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to them and I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Dylan, and thank you for the, uh, to the organizers, and thanks everyone for taking your time. I wish we could be in person. We're not. We're virtual, but um, we'll maybe one day, maybe next year, we'll be uh, in person. I'm John Culpepper. I have uh, been composting for mm, <laughs> 50 years, I suppose. Um, and for the last 20 years, I have managed uh, the facilities at North Country School and Camp Treetops in Lake Placid. I was the director of facilities and sustainability and managing all of the new construction, renovation, operations. Um, over that time, um, probably uh, worked on $50 million worth of worth of construction projects, but my passion really is in sustainability, uh, particularly organics uh, recycling. So uh, my daughter, Katie, is with us as well. Hi, I'm Katie. Uh, I'm joined by my daughter, Rowan, real multi-generational composting family. Um, so if you hear uh, baby noises in the background, that's what, that's what that is. Um, I have been uh, farming and in education over the last many years in the Adirondacks, and um, I'm excited to, to bring that experience into this work that we're doing with compost. So glad you're all here. Thanks for being here, and we'll leave plenty of time for questions at the end if you have them. All right. Uh, we are going to... Oh, this one here. Oh, no, this one right here. Yeah, like that. All right, Dylan, can you see my screen now? Yes, I can. Great. Okay. Looks great. Uh, thank you. By the end of this presentation, uh, hopefully, uh, we hope to convince you that organics recycling is crucial to forming more resilient food systems, 
and uh, that build our communities. That's, uh, that's what we're all about. And a quick little video that um, shows a complete food system. Great, and contact information will be provided uh, at the, uh, on the last slide. Um, this is our vision statement, and uh, we're quite proud of the work that, we're, uh, that we have been doing. And we really are focused on community building and, uh, and leaving a better earth than what we found. Um, I'm particularly uh, interested in positive positive impacts uh, to our earth and our communities. We are three individuals, um, myself, my daughter, and uh, Jennifer Perry, who works full-time at the Adirondack North Country Association. So none of us are really working on this full-time, except I am able to spend more time since I retired from my my full-time gig in early December, but we have done an enormous amount of work, I think, uh, in uh, with the, with the, the three part-time positions. We are associated with the with Adirondack uh, ADK Action, which is a um, um, a not-for-profit in the Adirondacks that does a lot of really really nice uh, work here, and we operate primarily from the grants that we write and receive. Uh, we do um, solicit some donations and receive some donations, but basically we're, um, we do our work as a result of, of the grants that we find, write, and receive. In the event that we uh, do more in-depth work with people, we, we can also do on a limited basis contractual arrangements. Um, as John said, most of our work is through grants that we uh, write and receive. We just finished up a year long one through the Pollution Prevention Institute um, that allowed us to, to kind of really dig into work in the Adirondacks um, in terms of community scale composting. We're now working on a, a USDA rural business development grant. Um, and you can see we're working with the, these four counties um, to try to kind of boost, promote uh, a robust community scale composting, kind of the circular economy with composting in the Adirondacks. Um, we're also working on a cloud, cloud splitter foundation grant that is focused on human urine composting, which we're excited about and John will discuss more in a bit. Um, and again, as John said, we, uh, all of that, those grant monies allow us to um, provide free consultation to, to communities. And we also have some uh, consultation services for things that go beyond that. Um, in terms of the work that we're doing right now, a lot of it is being um, encouraged by the new New York state legislation. Um, this came into effect in January of this year that requires large producers of food waste to um, seek out ways to donate or to recycle their, their food waste. Um, so we're working with towns and businesses and um, individuals who are interested in not just meeting that law, uh, meeting those requirements, but also getting ahead of that because though right now it only affects the large, large producers in our area, um, the trajectory is that like Vermont, uh, before too long, all organics will be um, will be illegal to landfill any organics at all. So um, a lot of our work is focused around educating about this law and um, helping communities meet this law. Um, we are really excited about this work. 
um, and as it relates to this summit, especially um, because we believe in compost role in building a resilient food system. Uh, as you can see, so often we think about or we operate with a food system that looks like this, that's very linear. Um, when you don't have those connect the, that connection between the growing and the disposing, you have a broken system. Um, just to, to drive this point home a little bit right now, we are uh, facing a shortage of fertilizer in North America. Uh, farmers are, are facing that going into this growing season. Um, so lack of fertilizer, that will lead to uncertainty, higher prices for fertilizer may lead to um, less fertilizer going onto fields and um, which can impact yields and may uh, make for uncertainty for consumers, maybe higher prices for consumers. That's happening all while we are sending billions of pounds of food waste to the landfill every year. Um, so that, that's a, a kind of stark disconnect of um, here we are in need and creating kind of this uh, really fragile system where we're uh, in need of fertility and not sure where to get it. And meanwhile, billions of pounds of food waste, uh, plant nutrients are going into landfills where they not only are not of use to farmers, um, and land managers, but also they are producing uh, a large amount of methane gas in that process. Uh -oh. Okay, um, instead, what we are proposing is uh, really focusing on compost and how the insertion of compost into that, into the food system creates a really resilient food system. Um, where there's not a beginning and an end, but instead there is a cycle, which um, seems really obvious, right? But uh, is so often not how our food systems operate. Um, but when these arrows um, all connect, uh, you're looking at a much more resilient food system. And in fact, the more arrows um, you have, the more resilient you the more connections you have, the more resilient that food system is. So if you're looking at a more localized food system, um, those, those errors are gonna go in all, every direction, every which way, and that's uh, creating that interconnectedness that we really rely on to have a, a robust food system. I guess, there we go. Um, so composting 101, we, we are uh, supportive of any sort of organics uh, upcycling or recycling uh, efforts. But uh, the way I think about it is three primary uh, ways to, um, to turn organics into something of value. Of value. Uh, aero uh, aerobic decomposition, which is uh, composting in all of its forms, anaerobic uh, decomposition, which is um, actually becoming one of the most uh, widespread and, and popular ways in the United States at the moment. There are large scale uh, anaerobic digesters going in at farms and municipalities. And what that does is utilizes uh, uh, bacteria that, that operate in the absence of oxygen and creates, uh, through their metabolism, creates methane gas. That methane gas is then burned to produce um, electricity uh, in most cases. And then also uh, processing uh, organics through insects or worms. Vermicomposting you may be familiar with, um, but there are a lot of insects out there that can do uh, that kind of processing. At Compost for Good, we are primarily focused on uh, aerobic decomposition, composting, and primarily at the community scale. That is somewhere between the, the backyard composter and the large commercial uh, uh, facilities. Um, organic material can be just about anything that was once alive. Um, organic material contains carbon. And some of this material is easier to break down uh, than other material. You might be a composter, you might uh, compost in your backyard. You might uh, know that vegetable material breaks down much, much easier than 
than meats and bones and fats and waxes and things of that sort. But all of that material can be turned into a beautiful, beautiful uh, compost. So um, in our work, we differentiate between um, what we are trying to compost and we call that feedstock. And that typically has high nitrogen content. Food scraps is, a, is a, an example of uh, feedstock. And then carbon material. Carbon is essential in aerobic decomposition um, and carbon provides uh, a variety of benefits to the, uh, to the microbes that are doing all the work. So really the, the operators of composting systems are nothing more than stewards of the millions and millions and millions of microbes that are doing all of the work. Uh, carbon can come in a lot of different forms and we're working with folks from a variety of places to, uh, to help them source the most available, cheapest uh, and best carbon source out there. Examples of things, uh, organics that can be composted, feedstocks that can be uh, composted, um, what you probably know uh, and are familiar with, food waste, yard debris, uh, and then a bunch of uh, material that's, uh, that isn't often talked about, um, uh, the, the leftover debris or the leftover offal from slaughterhouse uh, operations, animal mortalities, um, the state of Maine recently developed a big composting pro a program to compost, uh, I think it's seals that have washed up on the beaches in Maine. And you may not think that's a big issue, but when you have hundreds, if not thousands of seals that um, you have to deal with, it becomes a, a pretty, big, uh, pretty big issue. And they used to just dig holes in the ground and bury those seals, and now they're, uh, they're composting them. Uh, at Compost for Good, we also work on uh, human waste, at least, at least uh, the urine fraction of human waste. And I'd like to convince you that uh, diverted urine is an enormously uh, important untapped resource for the creation of high quality compost. There are researchers all over the world who are uh, out there right now trying to extract uh, plant nutrients and other products from human urine. When urine is diverted, that is to say, diverted at the source and not sent into the wastewater treatment plant, then um, important and valuable products can be extracted. Uh, we've developed a process that we believe is unique. Um, we don't believe anyone else in the world is doing this at the moment. And um, I have uh, presented at a number of international, uh, several international conferences on uh, urine diversion and reuse. And, um, and I can't find anyone else in the world who is simply processing human urine through a, a high temperature composting regimen. Um, it's simple, safe, effective uh, to do. And I believe we should be doing much, much more of it. That last picture on the right is me smelling a pile of, of uh, urine that has been composted. It uh, was simply mixed with water and uh, sawdust, and it creates a product that has a really good nutrient profile and looks and smells and feels just like what you would purchase at your local garden center. Um, a lot of reasons to make, uh, oops, sorry, a lot of reasons to make compost. Um, one of the more important reasons is, um, is that when compost is landfilled, it creates uh, methane gas. And methane gas, according to the US EPA, maybe 18 months ago, they were saying that uh, methane is, was 28 to 32 times as powerful uh, greenhouse gas uh, than uh, carbon dioxide. That number has gone up to 70 or 80 times more powerful. Now, Methane is a short-term greenhouse gas, but a powerful greenhouse gas and one that we don't, uh, one that we should be focused on more and more. Um, 
and when coupled with other good land management practices, um, organics upcycling can, can actually help with climate mitigation. Let me go into that just a little bit here. So a lot of information on this slide. It's important to understand that when organics, all organics are, uh, are processed, composted, um, methane isn't released like it is in, in the landfills. Um, so that's the, the first way that we can help mitigate uh, uh, climate change. But there is a more important end, um, uh, a way that this happens. A lot of research happening around the world right now about what happens when you add biologically complete compost to soils and match that practice with other good land management practices. It turns out that, um, that the plants outside of your window right now are, are, are photosynthesizing, producing sugars, simple sugars, and they're sending those sugars into the rest of the plant and into the roots. But what we've only just recently learned is that up to 40, 40 45% of those sugars are actually exuded through the roots. Now, this is a very energetically expensive process that plants go through. So why on earth would they exude up to 40 or 45% of the, the, the high energy comp uh, compounds that they produce through their roots? Well, they do that because they have co-evolved with uh, organisms in the soils that they work together with, um, and uh, in, in particular, mycorrhizal fungi. And um, so mycorrhizal fungi is, are really the, the key players in this process, but soils outside of the, uh, uh, the planet's oceans are the second largest carbon sink, uh, sink on planet Earth. There is an enormous opportunity, a tremendous opportunity to pull carbon out of the atmosphere and sequester that carbon um, in the soils in the form of living and dead portions of uh, uh, roots and mycorrhizal fungi and all the rest of the life in the soil. Um, really, really important uh, area of research and one that where the cycle times are really quite short. Um, so in a few short years, if you're managing a thousand acres of land, you can go from being a carbon emitter to a carbon sink. Um, aerobic decomposition can happen in lots of ways, um, typically involves a thermophilic phase or a primary phase and a secondary phase. And it is during the primary phase where you want high temperatures, those high temperatures, they kill weed seeds, they kill pathogens that we worry about, and they break down all the cell walls and the, and those, uh, and the proteins and sugars and turn them into uh, simpler compounds. That happens relatively quickly. Um, it is in the secondary phase where the real magic happens. That's when higher order organisms get involved, primarily fungi, and, um, and turn those carbon compounds into, into um, uh, large organic molecules that can persist in the soil for, for generations, for hundreds of years. So different processes yield different results. Uh, John was talking about different ways of um, that aerobic, aerobic systems um, break down food waste or organic waste in general. Um, hot compost, as he was talking about, thermophilic compost um, that will kill seeds, weed seeds that you want to um, get rid of in your waste. It will um, kill pathogens. Uh, that you may be worried about. Um, back to him talking about urine composting, that's where we, we can worry less about um, pathogens. Um, that hot compost, uh, there's lots of ways of doing that and we'll, we'll talk about those, but through that thermophilic aerobic decomposition is how we get the biologically complete compost that is so important for our soils. There are other ways to compost. Um, 
and some, some of those cooler aerobic systems um, like you might have in your backyard, like uh, some of those smaller tumblers that many homeowners use. Um, those don't optimize the conditions quite as well. They will not necessarily eliminate weed seeds or pathogens, but um, we are, are excited about anyone who's composting in any way uh, because of uh, the, the diverting from the landfill. Um, but the ways in which we can make that biologically complete compost is even better. Um, and I think we're, we'll go through. Did we, we skip the slide then? Oh yeah. Skip that slide, my favorite uh -oh. slide. Favorite slide. <laughs> um, sorry, we're gonna take you back to this slide. Um, so just let that sink in for just a minute. Um, there, there are research groups around the world who uh, apparently have quite a bit of time on their hands. And they do things like they estimate the number of stars in the universe or the number of grains of sand on planet Earth. Um, there is a research group at the University of Hawaii that has determined uh, within an order of magnitude or two that there are approximately 7.5 times 10 to the 18th grains of sand on all of the beaches on planet Earth. Based on my calculations using USDA numbers of the number of uh, microbes in a gram of uh, compost, there are twice that many microbes in the uh, in, in vessel unit uh, that we're going to show you in a few slides coming uh, forth. So each one of those microbes is producing a tiny amount of thermal energy, but when you when you compound that many uh, that much thermal energy, that many microbes, you end up with a tremendous uh, powerful system that uh, when used well, you can break down a lot of material in a hurry. So again, it's all about uh, uh, stewarding those microbes that are part of the process. Rachel, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So a, a couple of different ways of doing that. And again, each one of these uh, does that stewarding a little bit differently and maybe um, a little more effectively or efficiently. This is just kind of your most basic, although uh, I guess a pile, pile in your backyard um, is about as basic as you can get. That also will compost. Uh, food waste organic matter wants to break down, so there's there's uh, it's hard to to keep it. Those of you I'm sure have uh, all of you I'm sure have looked in your refrigerator and found things that are decomposing in there. So you don't need uh, special uh, conditions, but to do it well, um, you can help to optimize those microbes. So here's a, a pretty basic um, pallet composter. This is three bays. Um, this is something you might find in the backyard or at a community garden. Um, nothing wrong with a system like this. Uh, again, it's open to the elements. It's not necessarily going to give you um, that weed-free, pathogen-free uh, compost that you might want, but it is still composting and that is a good thing. We have a couple of videos, links to videos here for how to build one. Um, again, very simple and a good place to start if you're just getting into it. Here is one um, a little more uh, complex. This one's built out of straw bales. This is a 12 by 20 structure um, made of, of straw bales and uh, just a little bit of framing and um, greenhouse plastic. Um, this optimizes the conditions just a little bit better because you've got protection from the elements, protection from uh, rain and snow and wind. You don't have weed seeds blowing in. Um, and so you're, you're looking at a, a little bit of a, a better system, a little bit of a, an easier um, way to steward those microbes in this system. Um, a windrow system is a very common, especially on larger farms, very common way of composting. That is um, a little hard to see in this photo, but essentially you are just um, kind of creating these big, tall, long snakes of manure or food waste or whatever um, it is that you want to break down. You're turning that with a tractor. This is a, a really great way. You can get really hot compost, really good thermophilic action in these systems, um, but it does require more of a land base. Um, 
and the equipment to turn piles, so a tractor of some kind. So on a farm where land is not an issue or a tractor is not an issue, this could be a really perfect way of dealing with your organic matter. And this is a, a video that I shot down in South Carolina when I was there giving a presentation to the USCC, uh, US Composting Council, their international. So if you can hear my voice over that noise, uh, I'm gonna play it one more time, but look at the steam. Look at the steam coming out of the back of that thing. That's simply a function of all those microbes that are in that, uh, in that pile. Really quite astonishing. Uh, again, we're, we're focused primarily at the community scale, somewhere between the backyard composter and large industrial uh, uh, facilities. Uh, we believe, we actually know that uh, community scale compost uh, uh, initiatives nurture uh, communities, uh, keeps nutrients and dollars in the local economy, creates jobs. Uh, we are uh, currently uh, working on a grant to create manufacturing jobs and uh, organics hauling jobs and organics processing jobs. Um, in, in the state of New York, as a result of the new law that went into effect January 1, there's this enormous opportunity for job creation around the business of organics recycling. Uh, we are in a pretty interesting place. Can I just jump in here for this one? I think um, part of the reason community scale is so compelling for us is um, the transparency that that allows. Uh, when you're dealing with food waste within a community, whether it's at a community garden or community kitchen, transfer station or school, something like that. Um, when you see the food waste being processed right before you, there's a tremendous opportunity for education. And again, transparency, which we don't often have with waste and recycling, right? It's out of sight, out of mind. And um, where it goes, we don't really care or we don't really know and um, that's problematic and that uh, is a big part of why we are in our climate uh, crisis that we are in right now and so by keeping the composting systems uh, really close to home it allows not only for all of those nutrients to stay dollars to stay but also for the process to be um, right there for our kids to participate in for our community members to champion for, um, for locals to really get around. Uh, these are the nutrients of our community and we want them to stay in our community. And there's something really powerful about that, I think. Um, at Compost for Good, not only are we helping uh, folks uh, with their composting initiatives, we, we also design uh, what we call in-vessel rotating drum uh, equipment. We've got a, um, a, a couple of designs, or one design at least, on our website that's free and available to anyone uh, who is interested. We're passionate about this particular style of composting. Again, we're supportive of all types of composting. All types are good. Um, but this, this in-vessel drum is particularly good for community scale. Um, and can process uh, up to 50,000 pounds of uh, food waste uh, per year and about 15, 20,000 pounds of uh, carbon material as well. Good for community scale because, of, um, because it keeps out vermin, it keeps out dogs, bears, and, and all of that kind of thing. It's also uh, in the right setting, uh, really uh, uh, good for educational purposes. Uh, this is the another view of the unit that we have um, designed, and, um, and a number of these have been built. Um, uh, uh, we'll show you some places where they exist uh, at the moment. Uh, up next, I think we have. Are you done? Yeah, let me just say that um, I, I think I neglected to say not only uh, are these composters free and available, and our, our, our goal the is- The design to, is free and available. The, sorry. The, <laughs> the, design, 
free and available. And <laughs> our, our goal is for people to, to um, take the design and tweak it to meet their need, their particular needs. And um, we're very proud to say that a number of people from around the country and around the world have done this. We have composters e either being built of our design or have been built and being operated in Mexico, the Netherlands. Uh, we've got an effort going on in Belize right now. Um, so, yeah. Um, and I, I wanna just um, note that uh, we are not in the business of selling these composters or promoting this particular kind, except for the fact that um, it is it was our passion around community scale composting um, that led to the development of this design. Um, we think it really kind of captures the, the needs of a small community in terms of how to best utilize um, space and optimize conditions for um, microbes and all of that kind of stuff. So um, again, it's the design is free and available on our website. And up next is this in action. Um, okay. So if you can hear me over it, this is just another view of the composter in action. Um, it's a, a 20 foot long, four foot in diameter shipping, uh, sorry, uh, road culvert uh, can fit in a shipping container. Um, it's a very simple design made that way so that it would be affordable to build. Um, this one in particular is uh, at North Hinder School in Camp Treetops. It is uh, operated almost primarily by middle school uh, aged children. Um, takes them about 30 minutes to an hour a day to process the food waste from a community of anywhere from 150 to 300 people. Um, they are chopping the food waste, mixing it with carbon and loading it into this uh, unit every day. Um, so it can be done by, by wee ones. Um, and next up, this is uh, a view of a couple of the other ones that are out there uh, in the North Country. Um, you can see a few in shipping containers uh, that allows it to kind of tuck away and, and be lower profile if, uh, if that's the goal. Um, again, we promote it being very uh, educational and so um, no need to tuck it on the back 40, but um, that allows it to be contained and be insulated if necessary. Um, so just a, a kind of recap of what we're talking about when we're talking about composting and why we're so interested in that is that without composting, when we look at the food system, um, when composting is left out of it, it is a broken system, period. Um, and of course, broken does not equal resilient. Um, broken equals uh, unstable and unreliable and um, problematic for a number of ways, in a number of ways. Um, and so we know that composting can have a significant positive impact on climate change mitigation. We know that at adding biologically complete compost uh, can increase uh, the life in the soil, which does all sorts of good things. Um, and all in all, we know that when we have healthy soil, uh, we are healthier uh, in general. Soil is the foundation of, of it all. Um, and more and more research is showing that, that we don't need to feed the plants. We don't need to feed the crops. We need to feed the soil. Um, and compost is uh, the way to do that. Um, when we have healthier soil, when we have uh, robust soil ecosystems, um, we have more productive soils, we have more food, we have healthier food. When we have healthier food, more food, we have healthier people, we have better access to food. With healthier people, we have healthier communities. And with healthier communities comes more jobs, more resilience, more beauty, more collaboration, and more opportunity. That is it. Please do stay in touch. We would love to hear from you if you're interested in um, any of the work that we're doing or you think we may be able to help your community. Check out our website um, and our Facebook. And we have time for some 
questions if we have them. Um, and it looks like John might want to show some compost. I do. This is what it's all about, folks. Uh, this is a gorgeous, beautiful compost we've uh, processed uh, uh, through our uh, encouragement, through our uh, networks. We've composted hundreds of thousands of pounds of food waste and turned it into this material that smells just like the, a good forest floor. This is regardless whether it's coming from human urine or the most disgusting uh, rotten food waste you can imagine, you can turn it into uh, black gold. Well, I'm gonna turn on my video here. We do have some questions in the chat. Um, so I'll just address them at you two and then um, you can respond. From Heather, she was asking about the cost of the composter that, that you had built. I don't know if that information is available on your website or not, but that was the question. It's a great question, and I think it is available on the website. Um, uh, again, we don't, we don't uh, build and sell anything. We, uh, we've, we've developed the worst business model on the planet. We develop stuff and give it away for free. That's what we do. But we know that these units, these in-vessel units capable of composting about 50,000 pounds of, of feedstock per year can be built uh, under $30,000. Um, our our co-founder, one of our, co our other co-founder, Jennifer uh, and her partner have uh, designed and built one that can process uh, 70 to 80,000 pounds of uh, food waste uh, in a in a year. Um, if anyone is interested, we can put you in in touch with with uh, Jennifer or the people who have uh, the builder who has built uh, the ones that we've designed. Um, we can also put you in touch with a, a manufacturer who we support uh, in Ontario, Canada. Um, he's also made a, a design that's four foot in diameter and twenty feet long. So. Uh, roughly in the $20,000 uh, mark, but um, when, you, when you begin to calculate the, the volume, the material that comes out in the course of a year, um, if you're in the business of selling compost, you can, uh, you can pay for that initial upfront investment uh, pretty quickly, depending upon the, the market that you're in. Great question. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Um, from Laura, we had she says, do you have any resources you would recommend to small farms that are interested in taking on uh, some community scale composting? Yeah, we do. And I, I would say, um, check out our website. There are some resources there, but also um, we'd love to talk to you if you wanna reach out to us. Um, we'd love to, we, we spend much of our time um, having phone calls or Zoom calls with farmers or community members who are interested um, and, uh, because it's not a one size fits all uh, solution. Um, and so it's really great uh, to, to touch base with uh, those interested in really see what their needs are for their community or their, their hopes for, um, you know, are they trying to sell the compost? Or are they trying to use it on farm? Um, and so I, I would say still the best route is to um, get in touch with us and we can work through some of the options uh, for, for composters and for funding and all that kind of stuff. And there are some really great organizations out there from the United States Composting Council to the New York State Organics Council to um, the Pollution Prevention Institute, uh, New York State DEC. There are a lot of people, uh, a lot of resources out there. Um, just about any question you might have, uh, there are answers to it. Sometimes though, it's trying to find the right uh, person to talk with. And as Katie says, uh, if you have questions, even if you think, oh, these are silly questions, uh, reach out to us and uh, we can either help answer those questions or direct you in, in, in the direction where you need to go. Excellent. Um, earlier in your presentation, you mentioned that the New York State's law on composting organic, organics, excuse me, was a great opportunity. So Hannah had asked, is, uh, is that applicable to New York State public schools as well? That law. The, yeah, great question, Hannah. The the law that came out January one is uh, is targeting what's called a large scale uh, generators. Large scale generators, according to the uh, New York State DEC, are those 
organizations, businesses that produce um, uh, up to and, and above 2,000 pounds, two tons. Two tons, 4,000 pounds. 4,000 pounds, two tons of food waste per week. Um, and you might think, holy smokes, that's a lot of food waste. Um, and uh, the DEC is currently mapping all of the businesses, organizations in the state that meet that criteria. There, there are quite a few of them. And as Katie suggested, uh, we are hopeful that the state, uh, New York State, will follow other states' uh, lead and that this will be the first law that comes out. The next law, we think, we hope, we expect, will target uh, medium scale generators. And in time, it'll work its way down to the residential level. So that in time, um, I'm hopeful that um, no organics in the state of New York will go into landfills. And the DEC does have on their website, they have a list of the generators that fall under that, that um, fall under the law are generating enough to, to make them. Um, and a list of uh, processors or recyclers um, in in the state, and and there's a some caveats when you're looking into this. It's it's a great law and it's a good first step, but um, there have to be you have to be within a certain uh, range of a recycler or of a composter. And so we're in a little bit of this chicken or the egg. What comes first? Um, and part of the reason we're really trying to promote the business opportunities around. Um, composting and hauling and all of that kind of stuff is that that without the recyclers, then we're not going to be held to these laws. Um, but without the laws, there's not any any uh, uh, push to have these businesses. So um, we're really, we think we're right on the cusp of it really uh, exploding. And so we are, we are in particularly interested uh, helping people do on-site composting, schools, uh, municipalities, organizations, but there are a lot of different ways. If you have a, a, a substantial amount of food waste, if you're a business, um, there are more and more food waste haulers all the time uh, that, are, that are coming online. Um, and um, as Katie suggests, the, uh, the law is, is stimulating those business opportunities. So this isn't something that you have to do yourself. Uh, we, we, um, we're, we're excited to help people do that if that's what they want to do. But we're also excited uh, to connect you um, with local food scrap haulers um, to help you with your organics needs. Um, we have a question from Allison. She said, do you recommend that home composters avoid putting animal products uh, into their compost system since it's not thermophilic? Yeah, it's a tough one. Um, it, the Generally speaking, it's, well, not generally speaking, it's much, much more difficult to, to uh, compost animal products uh, in a backyard um, composter, um, especially if it's a static pile composter. Um, People do it. Uh, some people have more success than others. Um, if you were, if you're new to composting, we suggest don't start there. Start with your vegetable materials um, and work your way up, adding more and more difficult materials to decompose. Not only are animal products difficult to decompose, but they also um, can. The conditions inside the pile can go anaerobic and produce um, off smells produce flies, they can produce, um, they can, they can attract uh, vermin and animals to your pile. So certainly people do it. And certainly some people are successful. Um, but it, it requires, uh, uh, it requires a little bit of advanced knowledge in order to decompose, uh, to compost animal products. But we in, we encourage you to try it if you want to do it. Yeah, and I, I would say uh, advanced knowledge, maybe, but also it, it's kind of taking stock of your level of uh, what you want your level of involvement to be in your backyard composting. If you want to be really active and you want to be turning and you want to be taking temperatures, you want to be kind of testing where you are, and um, then you're much more likely to be successful in uh, breaking down meat products and dairy and things like that. If you want a pile where you can throw stuff outside and 
let it sit and it'll break down eventually, that's perfectly fine, but probably not where you want to be throwing meat products in that case. So um, I think recognizing where you are in, in the, the um, your enthusiasm for being hands-on to it is important. Great. Um, I have some questions uh, of my own, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, Katie, Katie, you mentioned feeding the, feeding the soil. Um, so I just wondered how you would best recommend folks or farmers apply the compost. You know, you said it's really important to feed the soil, but is it better if a cover crop is down and you're feeding that or, or what, what, what type of application helps stimulate the most um, biological activity? Yeah, that's a good question and a, and a difficult one. Um, there's lots of research about, uh, you know, no-till or till um, and cover crops. Always having cover on your, on your field is um, a positive thing. So cover crops, is, um, those are a good option. Um, if you are, if you have biologically complete compost that can be tilled in if that's your system and um, that'll feed the soil. If your compost is not complete, then you wanna use it as a, a top dresser. Um, lots of different ways of adding fertility to the soil. And I don't know that there's necessarily uh, the best way. It, it, a lot of it has to do with um, your resources and your farming practices, but adding compost, adding green manures in, um, as you were talking about cover crops, um, all of that helps to add fertility to the soil. And I would, I would add that it also uh, depends a lot on your cropping system. Right. So um, annuals, corn, soybean, things like that um, have different needs. And so farmers who uh, grow these uh, specific crops know what their needs are. And some types of compost, some types of applications work better in some systems than others. But uh, all in all, adding uh, uh, carbon back to the soil in the form of carbon compost or compost extracts uh, for that matter. And, and we're not gonna get into that too much because we don't have the time, but um, all, all, all is good for uh, stimulating the microorganisms in the soil that then uh, stimulate uh, plant growth and productivity. And I would add that um, increasing biodiversity on farms is a really important piece of um, adding uh, fertility and uh, soil life um, I'm not going to, again, get into whether till or no till is uh, the best way. There's lots of research out there, but um, when you allow kind of uh, underground communities to develop and that plant life to really establish itself, that is, um, that's important. Um, so biodiversity, both above ground and below ground, and letting those systems kind of mature and um, interact over long periods of time is better than uh, the annual systems that we have come accustomed to, though we rely on annual foods, and so we have to take that into account and um, grow accordingly. But uh, when in when in uh, when it's possible, long term systems. Yeah, I, I really like the symbolism there too. Building underground community and above ground community, and um, thinking long term. That's a really uh, beautiful parallel. Um, we only have a few minutes left, but another question I had was just about how, uh, you know, you, the two of you have been involved in a lot of different community composting efforts. What is your sense of the efficiencies uh, of scale? So like, what do you envision for the North Country? Um, do you envision many, many small compost operations or is there advantages to having a, you know, a large centralized uh, vehicle for, for composting? Um, you want me to take that? Sure. We love in this country to think big and to think large scale, um, but um, we are particularly focused on community scale, keeping things local, not, um, again, we're supportive of any composting facilities, be they Casella, who uh, is a really important uh, 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 organics hauler and composter in this region, or your backyard composter. We are particularly interested in, in uh, keeping uh, nutrients and dollars local. So my hope is that um, we will, every community out there of any, uh, 
of any size will find a, its own path towards uh, uh, recycling, upcycling their organics, whether it's through an in-vessel system or static pile system, whatever it is. Um, that's our hope, our goal, but again, a lot of different systems are out there and we're supportive of all of them. Yeah, I would, I would piggyback on that and, and just say that, yes, the reason that we're really interested in community scale is that it allows those, um, that interconnectedness to really flourish. And once you get into hauling and it's, it's out of sight, then um, you start to lose that connection um, and you get into a less uh, robust, resilient system. Um, and so it can look a lot of different ways, but keeping, keeping things close to home uh, is, is powerful for a lot of reasons. Yeah. Wow. Thank you guys so much. Not just, not just for your work, but for somehow fitting such a, such a volume of information into an hour. It's really impressive. And um, I'm sure you've given all of our participants a lot to think about. Um, and I encourage them to take you up on your offer to, to reach out. Um, yeah, we'd love to talk to you. Please do. Great. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.